Does having more guns on the street make us safer? Or does it make society more dangerous? I bring this up because of the story we told you about yesterday. 22-year-old Kevin Everett, living in a rough and tumble part of Winnipeg, he bought a gun to protect himself because he didn't really think the police could do the job anymore. He was being shot at in his own neighborhood. He wasn't involved in crime, wasn't involved in a gang. Police prosecutors and defense attorneys all agree with that, but still, Everett's going away for 21 months. Why? Police picked him up after he matched the description of a suspect wanted in an armed robbery. He put up his hands and told them before they even got close, look, I've got a pistol in, my back, in the back of my pants and I bought it for protection. He had no priors. He hasn't gotten into trouble with the law since he was arrested in 2008. Still, he had to say goodbye to his children the other day. Now, Mr. John Lott has written extensively on the issue of guns and crime and whether more guns or even concealed carry laws help make people safer. Mr. Lott joins us now. Uh, Mr. Lott, uh, it seems counterintuitive here in Canada, where we seem to love gun control legislation, but you've looked at the situation in the U.S. where it really is a patchwork quilt from Chicago, where for a long time there was a handgun ban to states like Florida, where pretty much anyone can get a concealed carry permit. Uh, what did you find? All right, well, now 49 states, 49 of the 50 states, have laws that let people carry permanent concealed handguns. Uh, 41 of those states are f very liberal rules, make it fairly easy for people to go and get uh, concealed handguns to carry. Look, I mean, it'd be great if the police were there all the time to protect people. My research finds the police are the single most important factor for reducing crime. But the thing that the police understand themselves is that they virtually always arrive on the crime scene after the crimes occurred. And that raises the question, what do you advise someone to do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves and simply telling people to behave passively is not very good advice. What we find right now in the United States, we have about 7 million Americans that have concealed handgun permits. Uh, it's been increasing fairly dramatically in the last couple of years, gone up uh, about a million and a half over that period of time. And uh, what you find is that as states issue more permits, you see drops in violent crimes. Murder rates fall by about 2% for each additional year the law is in effect. Rape and uh, robberies fall by about one and a half percent. And uh, what you f find is that the people who benefit most from these laws are exactly the type of person that's in this case in Winnipeg. It's poor people who live in high crime urban areas uh, who benefit the most, who are most likely to be victims of crime, who benefit the most from having the option to protect themselves. I understand that there have been a couple of occasions where Americans have bought guns on a, a large scale. Uh, after Columbine and after President Obama was elected, uh, people thought there were going to be tougher gun control laws. And so lots of people, almost half a million, went out and bought uh, firearms. And there was a corresponding drop in crime. Are you able to connect that between buying guns, having guns, and, and, and say there is a direct cause and effect relationship there? Well, it's, it's pretty hard to do it just on a national basis where you have a change because there are lots of other things that can vary. But, there's one simple point I can make, and that is I can't find a place, any place in the world, where we've had a ban on guns and murder rates have gone down. In each place that I've looked at, you either see small increases or very large increases. Now, you may know Chicago and Washington, D.C. in the United States, people in Canada may be familiar with the huge increases in murder rates and violent crimes that we had in both of those cities after the bans went into effect. Uh, what they may not know is that in D.C., after the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the city's gun ban there, murder rates there fell by 36 percent in two years. So not only did we have this big increase as soon as the ban went into effect, but as soon as the ban was eliminated, we saw this huge drop. And it's not just Chicago and Washington, D.C. You know, people say, well, they really weren't fair tests because unless you ban guns every place, you're going, criminals can go and get guns in other places and bring them into those areas. Well, there's two points. One is, it would have been nice if they had told us that, uh, that they didn't think this was going to work, having those bans. But secondly, it doesn't explain the increase in crime. It may explain why it didn't fall. And yet, you look around the world, even island nations that don't have some neighbor to go and blame, whether it's Ireland or the UK or Jamaica, in each of those cases, after you've seen handgun bans go into effect, 
we've seen at least some increases in murder rates. Uh, the UK, after their ban in January 97, uh, and Ireland, Jamaica, after their bans in the early 70s, in the latter two countries, you've seen either six to eight fold increases in murder rates after the bans went into effect. And, and, and they're so, not alone. So do you put this down to the bad guys essentially not knowing if somebody's packing? They're going to be a bit more cautious. As a friend says, everyone's polite in the, in the Wild West. Right. Well, I, I, think there, I think that's an important point. I think there are basically two general points. One is is that um, uh, who obeys the laws? And you know, a simple gun ban is a good example there. When you pass these bans, it's basically the good law-abiding citizens who turn in their guns, not the criminals. And rather than making it safer for uh, victims, what you do is you unintentionally make it safer for the criminals. And the same thing's true with concealed carry. You know, you go and you say law-abiding citizens like this gentleman in Winnipeg can't go and defend themselves outside of their home. Well, the criminals don't obey that. It's just the law-abiding citizens that do. And so rather than make it so safe for the victims, you unintentionally make it so that the attackers have little to be concerned about. It's kind of, let me give you a thought experiment. Let's say somebody was really threatening you or your family. I mean, was seriously yeah. threatening you with real violence. Would you feel safer putting a sign in front of your home that said this home is a gun-free zone? You think that would make it less likely that the criminal would want to break into your home to go and attack you? No. no okay, well, that's, not at all. that's essentially what we've, that's what we've done with so many of these areas when we go and we ban law-abiding citizens being able to carry guns. You know, the, as you point out, the criminals don't know until they actually go and attack someone whether that person's going to be able to defend themselves. with. You know, we have some states like Pennsylvania uh, that has set 800,000 people with concealed handgun permits. It's about seven, over 7% 7 of the adult population. You know, that, that means a criminal, when they go and attack somebody, a woman walking in a dark alley late at night or uh, in a parking lot, that's a risk to the criminal. And you see some deterrence as a result of that. And the thing is, even people who don't even own guns benefit because the criminals don't know whether you're the type who will own a gun before they go and attack you. All right, Mr. Lott, thank you very much. Great food for thought. And anyone that wants more, please check out John Lott's books, uh, More Guns, Less Crime, and The Bias Against Guns. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much.